standing all over the sanctuary. How many of you in here really believe that if he tell you right division, he's going to do what he says? I mean, do you really, really believe it? Huh? Do you really believe it? Then I just need you to put your hands together and give God a round of applause and a confirmation to say you believe what he has told you, what he has instructed you to do. Amen? Amen. How many of you are just enjoying the spirit of the Lord in here today? Yeah. It's coming in and just feeling at peace and feeling God's peace and witnessing the testimonies and the prayers that have gone forth. All of that just strengthens us. The fact that just we have been here, we were here last Sunday and God has seen fit to bring us back again this Sunday. As the old folks say, everybody didn't make it to today, but he made us to see today. Amen. I'm going to ask you if you would please turn to the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to be at the 16th verse, I mean, part of the 16th chapter, starting at the 13th verse. And I'm reading from the NIV version. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some said John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. I'd like to go back to verse 18 when Jesus said, and I tell you that you are Peter. And I tell you, you are Peter. This morning we want to talk about the need for validation. The need for validation. Many Christians don't always feel good enough. Save, or we don't feel like we quit, quite fit in. Look successful, but don't feel successful. Anointed, but don't feel anointed. Don't fit in with the family. Don't fit in with your friends. Always feeling like you're not good enough. But God says that you are. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you and we praise you and we bless you. And now, God, as we come to this time of breaking your word to your people, God, I pray for a decrease in myself. And Father, I pray for your increase. I pray for a fresh anointing. And Father, I pray that you will bless and touch the ears that, and have prepared them to receive your message on this day. And Father, whoever came in broken in spirit, we are claiming by faith night right now that they will leave from this place healed by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. You may, amen. amen. You may be seated. The need for validation. The need for validation. Jesus did something for Peter that all of us desire, and that is to be validated. To be validated. When Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter responded, you are Christ the son of the living God, Jesus validated Peter and affirmed him by acknowledging that Peter's encounter with the Holy Spirit. Jesus then returns and he validates him again within that same phrase by changing his name from Simon to Peter, which was a prophetic validation affirming Peter's transformational process from an unschooled Galilean fisherman 
to become a disciple, to later to become an apostolic transformational leader in a movement that will turn this world upside down. All of us, every one of us, need to be affirmed and valued as a person. And as we go through scriptures, we, we see the importance of validation and how God took the time to validate his people. He sent Samuel out in the countryside to find a shepherd boy who had been overlooked by his family to tell him that one day you are going to be a king. And that same boy, David, grew up, and God sent him to Lodabar, told him to find this boy who was broken in his childhood. His name was Bephibosheth. He took him from out of Lodabar and took him and set him at the king's table. Elizabeth validated Mary. When she went running to Elizabeth to say that she had an encounter with the Holy Spirit and that she was going to be the mother of the long-awaited Messiah, and Elizabeth validated her experience. So what is validation? What does that mean to us? Let's put it in the simplest term. Validation is someone outside of myself acknowledging my personhood, my worth, and my experiences. It's not saying that you agree with me, but you acknowledge me. You see me for who I am. It's seeing me and not overlooking me. It's hearing what I have to say and not ignoring me. It's talking with me and not at me. Too many people have not been seen but overlooked. Too many people have not been heard but ignored. And too many people have gone through people talking at them but not taking the time to talk with them. Parents are asked to, to validate their children by letting them know that, that we understand him or her, that we, so we start to speak positively to build healthy self-esteem and encourage a positive self-image. Parents are called to put that seed into their children. I remember um, going through that awkward stage of adolescence, that stage, you know, where we're growing out of childhood and moving into a teenagehood, and we're already feeling some kind of way about ourselves, body going through changes, things going on around us. And I remember one day that my dad and I, along with one of my cousins, we were looking at my middle school yearbook. And so my cousin said to my dad, he said, hey, Harold, who is the prettiest girl on this page? And I was standing there and I was looking on the page too, and I was ready to point out who I thought was the prettiest girl on the page. But before I went to point it out, my dad said, this is the prettiest girl and he was pointing to my picture. And I was standing there and I was really stunned by it because you see, I didn't see myself as being the prettiest girl. See, I compared myself to the other girls. My hair didn't look like that. I wasn't built the way they were built. I had that chocolate skin. I didn't see myself as pretty and it took my dad to speak into me and says, I see you, I validate you, I accept you for who you are, I approve of you. And that was the turning point in our lives. Yeah. It's when the first man you ever love or the first woman you will ever love says to you, I see you, you're good enough. And that's the thing that turned around, and that's the thing where so many of us get off track when we start comparing ourselves to someone else. We compare how we look. We compare what we drive. We compare where we live, what kind of work we're doing. Some of us even compare the gifts and the talents that God has given to us, and we compare it to what someone else is doing. I don't preach like they preach. 
I don't, I, I, you know what, I just seem like I just can't get there where they're going. And you know, that's one of the hang-ups of preachers because we're always looking at uh, what other people are doing instead of staying in our own lane. I don't dance like this person. I don't sing like this person. And we compare ourselves and ignoring the fact that God gave us a gift, but we seem to be ignoring what he has given to us because it's in a way still saying, but it's not good enough. It's not good enough. It's not good enough where I am. To be good enough, it doesn't mean that you don't need anyone. To be, to be good enough doesn't mean that you are complete, doesn't mean you're perfect, doesn't mean you don't have faults and failures, don't need, doesn't mean that we need to shape up and get some stuff together. What it does mean is that God has made you to be as you are. And the way that he made you, he did it on purpose and he did it with purpose. One thing that we're going to have to face and accept, there's always going to be somebody smarter than who we are, yeah. fitter than who we are, going to look better than what we are, going to preach better, dance better, whatever it is, my message is get used to it, it is what it is, stay in your lane, be the best you that you can be, and keep it moving. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep it moving. So someone in here might be saying, saying, well, you know, my dad didn't validate me like, like, he, like he did, your dad did you. Or my mom or my, my grandmama or whoever raised you. They didn't, I didn't get that validation. I, I, didn't, I didn't get those things that, that changed my life. I, I just didn't have anyone to validate me. No one told me I was okay. No one, no one said, I see you and that, I, and that you're meaningful and that you have purpose. No one said, told me those things. So what am I supposed to do about that? What am I supposed to do because the one who was supposed to give it to me did not give it to me? And now I'm out here feeling like I'm broken and lost and incomplete. So this is what I just have to say to you. Is that you are in this room right now. And because you're in this room, and I am the one who is speaking, and because God uses people, he's therefore using me, therefore I'm validating you in the name of Jesus Christ. You may have come in here unvalidated, but you are leaving validated. You may not feel like it, but you're going to have to grasp it in your spirit and walk in your validation. Because here is the thing, a lot of people have already been validated, but they haven't accepted it, and so they fail to walk in it. I'm saying to you, if you've been validated, walk in it. Walk in it. You're not always going to feel good. You're not always going to feel anointed. You're not always going to feel smart and intelligent. You're not always going to feel. If you base your life on how you feel, you will never ever get anywhere. Sometimes you just got to get up off of your seat, put one foot in front of the other, and understand who you are in Christ who you are because the truth of the matter is the day is for excuses if you are in this church you don't have a reason to have an excuse because see the purpose of church is not to come and to hear a great message and to hear wonderful songs and to lay out at the altar and to get our praise on. The purpose of church is to come and to be changed. It's to be changed. It's to leave from here and go out and be better than what you were before you came in. Do you follow what I'm saying? Because if we don't change, then what we're doing right here is a performance. It's a production. We go by the script. At this time I shout, at this time I lay on the floor, at this time. But when you get up, has a change come? So that is the thing of validation. 
When God is working, he's working through you. And so anyone who is in here and under my sound, of, uh, under, again, under the sound of my voice, God is putting his stamp of approval on you on this day. On this day, he is stamping his, his approval on you. He has approved of you. And he speaks in his word. He approves of you so much that he has counted every number of hair that is on your head. He knows every, he has a sign. Get this. He has a, a sign, a number to every strand of hair on your head. I, I, I think you need to sit and marinate on that for one minute. For those of you who have hair. And for those who don't, he remembered how many you did have. He hasn't forgotten you. But Jesus wants you to get up, live, and live your best life in Jesus' name. That's what he wants us to do. He doesn't want us to continue to be stuck on pause, stuck on what people said and what people did to us. Get over it. As the saying goes, they talked about Jesus. So I want to talk to a few minutes for those of you who never felt like you fit in. You never felt like you fit in. You out with your family. You love them. But for some reason, you just don't quite fit. You hang out with your friends, and, and you go out, and you travel, and you hang dinner, and you just hang out. But even among your friends, your, your close friends, the ones that you will call on in the middle of the night, because you, you have that right, you can do that. That's how tight you are. And even though you're tight like that, you still don't feel, feel like you quite fit in. You always feel like you're the odd one. <laughs> Even when it comes down to opinions, it seems like your opinion is usually different from everyone else's. It seems like your viewpoint just doesn't line up with other people's viewpoint. And you've just been trying to figure out why is it that you feel so different and why is it that it seems that people even treat you different? Why is it that it seems like some folks can get away with certain things but you can't get away with? They call you in check. But yet they're over here, somebody's doing the exact same thing, but you, you, you're not supposed to do it. Well, here's the thing. I hope to set you free today. You don't fit in because you're not supposed to fit in. You, 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 you don't fit in because God didn't, he, he made you intentionally to be different. You don't fit in because God made you to stand out. There is a difference. He has put something in you, and that, that something in you, and however he's going to use you in his kingdom, that's the way he's going to use you. So he wants you to stop trying to be like your friend and stop trying to understand why your family doesn't understand you. They don't understand you because they don't need to understand you because you're not working for them. He's calling you to work for him. And where he has you to go, he's going to put you in a place that only you can take care of it, only you can handle that business because you know what it feels like to be odd, to be different, to be talked about because you just don't fit the mold. You are not supposed to fit the mold. Embrace it and live life because that's where he wants you to go. So you are who you are. And so here's a good chance is this. You might be saying, well, I still didn't feel like you're validated. Now, let me just add this part to you. Sometimes some people really, that you've been validated. God validated you a long, long time ago. See, the issue is that some folks did not recognize where the validation was coming from. Or, or I should put it this way, they were expecting the validation to come from another one person and someone they least expected is the one who brought it to them. And because the one that they least expected brought it to them, they did not receive it and didn't count it as validation and they overlooked it. And what God is trying to say is, but I sent someone to you and you need to not look at and define who's supposed to come and lay their hands of approval on you. I have sent someone else to lay their hands of approval on you. Now you need to take that approval, accept it, and walk in it. The thing of it is, is you are not broken. You are becoming. 
Is that anything wrong with you? You are becoming. He has validated you. You are becoming who he has created you to be. So those are some of the things that validation means. And as we look at how God validated Peter, I mean people, and, and especially Peter. You know, I really like Peter. Peter is straight up the... He really is. He really is. But this is the thing. Peter, Peter loved Jesus, but cussed like a sailor. Y'all know y'all got some friends like that. You know, some of you do like it. You love Jesus, but you still cuss a little. Let the church say amen. Everybody say amen to God. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just might as well, might as well own it. <laughs> At least you know when and where to. <laughs> Peter, Peter was loud. Peter was just rough around the edges. You know? He was impulsive. And Peter had the nerve to try to check people. He even tried to check Jesus. He even ran up on Jesus one time and told Jesus what he wasn't supposed to say and do. But Jesus turned around and checked him. Anybody in here ever been checked by Jesus? When Jesus check you, you know you've been checked. Amen? Amen. You don't even question where that was coming from. Jesus even checked him. Peter, Peter, Peter was, Peter, Peter carried weapons. A lot of Christians do pack. Amen? Amen. You know, some of you, you know, you do, you is what it is. Peter had a knife. We do have relatives who carry knives. And Peter just had a temple, so when they went out in the garden, you remember what Peter did when the soldier came up? Peter did what? He pulled his blade up, cut the man's ear off. Peter didn't ask no questions. He just took the knife out, slashed off the man's ear. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is what Peter did in front of Jesus now. And I think the only reason he got the man's ear, because the man must have turned his head, because I think Peter was going for that man's throat. Peter was that kind of guy. Peter was, was that he was that guy, but then on the same side, on the other side, Peter, a part of, part of Peter came, came out of him later on where Peter didn't even believe of himself. He didn't believe he would do it himself. And that's when he, when he, when he denied who Jesus Christ was. Yeah. Here is the man who said to Jesus, I will go with you and I will die with you. And just in a few days later, the same man runs in fear and hides. You see the contrast. This is the same man that Jesus validated. This is the same man that Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. This is the same man that Jesus turned around and said, I'm now going to change your name from Simon to Peter because this is what I'm going to do for you and this is the role that you're going to play in my church. The same man fell. We'll talk about that one Sunday too. How do you fix something that you already broke? How do you fix something that you have broken and you can't fix it again? So Peter was all of this, but yet Jesus saw through Peter's messiness and he validated Peter as the rock that he would, and that he would build his church on. And that is what validation is all about. It's Jesus looking through our messiness to show us that we are valuable, that we are significant, and that we are important to him. Now here is the flip side. We all need validation, but sometimes validation is not done properly. Or sometimes it's not done at all. And so when, that's not, when that happens, then we're left with a void in our lives. 
we're left with this thing of trying to fill this void. And that's how we end up with people we should not be connected with. That's how we end up in relationships that are not good for us. That's how we end up on jobs and in positions that are not for us or in friendships because we're trying to fill this void. We're trying to fill this, this, this emptiness. And, and the thing of it is is that we're trying to do it and so we're seeking for approval. We're looking for validation. And what happens is people who lack validation in their lives do not understand understand their value and their worth because no one told them that they had value and they had worth. So what happens to them? Some of them tend to become what we call people pleasers. People pleasers. They're the ones who do never say no. They're the ones no matter what you ask, they're going to make a way, they're going to try to fit in, they're going to try to do whatever you ask them to do. People, pre pre people pleasers don't disagree with you. They're always going to be in agreement. Even though on the inside they don't agree, but because they feel that if I disagree, I might lose that friendship. I might lose that thing that I'm trying to be connected to. Because they long for acknowledgement and, ex and acceptance and the need to be significant. So they try to fit in with people, with people that they want to be like, hoping and feeling that they will feel, accept, be accept, feel acceptance and will be like. People please will, all, will also try to fit in with people who don't even like them. People pleasers can be in a group, know they're not being treated fairly, being overlooked, always the, the brunt end of someone's joke, always being dismissed, but yet they will still try to remain friends and be a part of that group or that circle because they just want to fit in. I know we've all seen people pleasers. They're making their way and trying to be who they, trying to be something that they're not and they're trying to hide how they feel and the point of the real thing is, is that often people pleasers will come off that they feel good about themselves and they try to hide the fact that they really don't feel that great about who they are. Jesus said to Luke 6, uh, said in Luke 6, 26, and this comes from the Message Bible, he said, there's trouble ahead when you live only for the approval of others, saying what flatters them and doing what indulges them. So God doesn't want us going down that road because our value is not in who we are and what we do. It does not come from how much money we make how attractive we are or how many times that we can get the answer right. Our value and identity is rooted in who God says that we are and, who he, and also in who he is. Jesus asked the disciples a profound question. He asked them, he said, who, who do you say that I am? He first, of course, asked, well, who do men say? And then he flips it back and he goes back to them and he said, now I want to know who do you say that I am? Who you said of them? Who, who am I to you? What is my relationship to you? And how do you relate to me? Again, Jesus wasn't seeking validation for himself. Jesus knew perfectly well who he was. But the question is a deep and personal question. And it's one that you and I need to ask ourselves on a regular basis. And that is, who am I? Who am I? Because what we, have, what we believe about Jesus is the foundation of how we begin to believe about ourselves. It is the core. Our identity, our self-worth, our self-esteem, our value, everything is rooted in whatever our response is to that question. Who do you say Jesus is? Who is he? What does he really mean to you? Some of us have had the wrong people speaking into our lives. And for others, our identity and our worth has been defined by negative circumstances and experiences. It's been, it's been coming from people who did not even have the license to validate you because they were never validated. And so in turn from that experience that some of us have had, 
We have come to believe that we are being authentically ourselves. And we do not and have not come to the realization that, that our identity really has been stolen or damaged. Some of us are suffering from identity theft, but we don't even know that we are the victims of it. And so we grow up, and we grow up thinking that we are someone that we really are not. And often identity theft occurs at an early age when we are most vulnerable, when we are unable to make the distinction from what is right and what is wrong. That's when the enemy comes in. And so we grow up without proper validation, becoming who God did not intend us to be. And I believe if every one of us would just take a moment and flip that question and ask God for ourselves, who do you, Jesus, say that I am? The world has told me who I'm supposed to be. The world has told me that I'm to base how, my identity off of how I feel. The world has told me that my identity or my truth is based on what my beliefs are. But the question we need to ask Jesus is not what does the world say about you. The question is what does Jesus say? Who are you? Have you all of these years been living a lie but didn't even know it? That's the question that we are to ask ourselves. And that's the question that I'll leave you with this morning. When we have been properly validated through Jesus Christ, we then become secure within ourselves. We know we have worth, we know we have purpose. And when the storms of life begin to rage, we may bend but we don't break because we know who we are. You see, when you've been validated, it's easier to be humble because you know your worth and you know what you bring to the table. You don't have to try to show somebody up to show your intelligence because you know who you are. You know your value. You don't have to put someone down in order to make yourself feel better. Because when you know who you are, you don't have to do any of those things. You see, that's why Jesus, when he stood before, when he stood before the, uh, um, the, um, the, the judges, he said, he, they asked, well, who, do you, who are you? He didn't ask them. First of all, he didn't ask them, because what was the point in talking to people who don't even understand? And sometimes we need to make that decision. Sometimes you don't need to justify yourself because the person you're talking to don't have the ability to comprehend it. That's why you don't share your vision and your dreams with everyone. Because everyone can't grasp a hold what the dreams that you may have. They, it's not their dream. They don't have the ability. And so he didn't even speak those words. He didn't say anything. Because what was the point? So God wants us to be able to come to the point that when we are standing in the midst of a storm and when people are questioning who we are, when people are saying that you are not who you are, who you claim to be, that we can stand firmly and say, I know who I am in Jesus Christ and it's not going to sweat me or bother me that you don't understand who I am. You understanding me is not my problem. That's not my problem. Your problem is you need to figure out who you are because I already know who I am. So our, ability come, our validity comes from the one who created us. And when we lock into that fact, when we lock into that fact that you and I have been fearfully and wonderfully made, then we can learn to live by God's measuring stick and not put up a measuring stick that we have designed or created of our own. God is the one who validates us. He is the one who gives us our worth and he will put people in your lives to tell you that you are good enough the way that you are. Just live for him, follow him, and don't sweat the small stuff. Amen? Amen. Amen.